The reading today is from Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a frag fra fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of in immature, uh, impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, impure or greedy person such as a person is an, such a person is an idolatry has an inheritance in the kingdom of God uh, in the kingdom of Christ and of God let no one deceive you with empty words for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient therefore do not be partners with them for you were once darkness but now you are the light light in the lord Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that's illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said... Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as, as, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debocracy. Uh, instead, be filled with the Spirit speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make every music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here ends the reading. Thank you, Al. Let's join together in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word to us today. Um, I pray, Father, as you challenge us uh, with this word, that you would also encourage us and that you would help us to see, Father, of your amazing grace and love in the midst of a call to live as holy people. So I pray that your word would come alive in us, that it would not just be something that is, uh, goes in one ear and out the other, but it truly transforms us and changes our action and our attitudes for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We've been uh, this summer looking at the book of Ephesians, so I encourage you to take out your Bibles. And uh, there are some, if you don't have them with you, there are some red ones in the seats in front of you if you want to do that. And uh, turn uh, to um, Ephesians. Uh, chapter uh, 5. I think it's important that, um, that we get into God's Word. It's God's Word that we need that will change us and mold us and shape us and give us the strength that we need, especially as we go through um, our, our uh, day and our week uh, to come. So I want to encourage that. Just a kind of a review of where we've been at. Um, Ephesians was written to a church that was very much probably similar to like New York City in that day and age. It was, it was a huge uh, city, but it was full of a lot of things that were um, not of God. Uh, there were different, a lot of uh, immorality going on. There was a lot of, of hedonism, of, of following after other gods. There was Jewish presence that was in this community but it was very, very uh, secular as well. And so when Paul was writing to these individuals, he was in prison in Rome. And he had, he had been in these cities for, in, in Ephesus for a long, long time, and he knew these people well. And he knew what their struggle was. 
And so he addresses specified issues that they are go- that are going on in their uh, community. And sometimes he comes across in this text today. It seems like a very condemning text, doesn't it? As you listen to it. But he's talked with the people about, first of all, that there is no division among you, whether you're a Jewish person or whether uh, you are a Greek or you're, whether you're some secular person. If you, know, if you come to Jesus, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. There's no hierarchy level of importance. Paul is very clear on that. He also makes it very clear that those individuals in each of us are saved not by what we do, but by God's grace. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do to achieve salvation. And he makes that there's some basic foundations undergirding what he's trying to teach the church in Ephesus. And he's, that's another part of it is he's show, teaching them, don't realize or realize that there is this grace that's undergirding. But he also calls them and he says, you are called for a purpose. I have works for you to do. I have things for you to do. It just doesn't stop at salvation. It's about moving ahead in the faith. It's about doing things for others in service and helping others to grow. There's preordained things. As we are saved by grace, it just doesn't stop and we just go on our merry way. But God has things for us to do that will build others up. Last week, we talked specifically how God wants us to look at and grow us in maturity. That we aren't just to be saved and then kind of go on our merry way. But there are certain things that we need to be engaged with to grow our faith. We shouldn't be just satisfied with just this grace that's given. God has so much more for us. Not just as individuals, but he wants us to grow us as a body. I talked about how this coming, this year, we're looking at how God is calling us to a deeper walk with him in a walk of discipleship. And we're going to learn this next year of how to do that in practical ways of how to grow our faith. So I, I invite you to be a part of that as we look to this coming year and to be a part of, of small groups if you would like to because there's those being formed and also uh, part of the Sunday morning uh, services and the teaching will be about growing our discipleship. And I encourage you and to be praying about, Lord, how is it that you want to grow me? Today, I want us to talk about how that begins, how that maturity and foundation, foundationally begins. And it begins by being imitators of Christ, about, about being imitators of what he um, has shown us. Um, in different translations in the scripture, it talks about be imitators of God. Another one talks about follow God's example. And we see that example specified in what Jesus, how Jesus lived. So to get us kind of understanding of, of this whole understanding of imitation, I thought it would be interesting to see what is it that we imitate in our culture. Especially from our kids, right? So watch this video about kids. Even in that way, right? Even with cell phones. 
I know at home that's true. Um, have the lights up. I think in that they, they, uh, our kids mimic us so often, don't they? And uh, oftentimes they do it even when we wouldn't like them to do what we would do, right? We say maybe to do something different and they actually do what we do, not necessarily what we say, right? Um, one of the, some of the things that we see in our kids kind of makes us proud, proud, uh, pride, have pride in us as well. We're proud of them, and we want to spur that on. And uh, our little one from um, China has, it's interesting, he comes uh, to church sometimes in what he calls his pastor outfit. <laughs> and he wears his little bow tie, and he, but he does things a little different. He not, only, he not only wears this nice suit or whatever, but then he wears flip-flops. <laughs> and I want you to see this. So if you want to turn this up as we watch this little clip from JJ. I want to be a pastor like that. that uh. I know it was kind of staged. <laughs> but he does say that. And it's, it's interesting to watch him um, come up to me and follow me around. Those of you who sometimes recognize that, some, they usually come to the second uh, service. And, and they, he follows me around. He comes up and he, and he wants to kind of join me in that. Again, I wonder sometimes if he's, that part of him is, he's imitating me, right? Am I an example for him? That's really convicting to us as parents, isn't it? Am I living the way that's a good example for my child, for him? Scripture for today, be imitators of God, therefore is dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us. They want to walk in our shoes, right? And sometimes they follow that example, and sometimes we'd rather have them not, right? But Scripture talks about us fall being imitators of Jesus. I remember um, when my dad told me that uh, he had a dream that one of his sons was going to be a pastor. And, and I remember that my brother who was seven years older than me. I was about in 10th grade. He was well on his way to become a pilot. And so I can remember those, that sense in me of do I want to follow in my dad's footsteps and be a pastor? Do I want to imitate him in that way? And I realized that I needed, that needed to be part of my own call. But it was part of that example of parts of his life, realizing that some of his life wasn't the best, just like me. But there's part of some of that life that's inspiring to me that I wanted to enter into following in that footsteps, to follow after him. He calls us to be imitators. I think I tell uh, those that are going through baptism um, times with me when I prep them for baptism, especially those that are going through the first time of baptizing their first kid. And I talk about a statistic that I think is really uh, eye-opening, especially for fathers. If both parents come to church and are engaged in their faith and are living their faith, probably around 90 to 95% of the time, uh, ch children will follow in the example of their parents, engage in faith. On the flip side, if they're 
parents come and drop their kids off for Sunday school, and they just go on their way, and they don't really engage in their faith, probably around maybe 10, 15% of the time, a child um, will have the faith, that faith that they're being brought to Sunday school, which makes sense, right? Which I think is the, the two uh, kind of revealing statistics, uh, statistics that I think are revealing to me at least, were if a mother was to bring their child uh, engaged in faith, and the father wasn't engaged, about probably around 40% of the time, a child will take on the faith of their mother. This one, I think, is really revealing. If a father is engaged in his faith, and for some reason the mother is not engaged in her faith, but is encouraging that faith in the growth of their child, about 70% of the time, the child takes on the faith of their father. They're looking at us to be examples, to follow in, the, in, their, in our, foot, with their, our footsteps, right? And to know that even though we're not perfect in that, that God has a call for us as fathers to be imitators. In this text today, Jesus is saying to us, follow my way. Be imitators of who? Of God. And what are his characteristics? It's about getting to know what those characteristics are. And we see them in the life of Jesus, of what some of those characteristics are, of being a servant, of giving sacrificial love, of forgiveness, of humility. And the list goes on and on. We can name them. About the characteristics of God. And there's a call upon each of us as Christians to be imitators of God, to practice what we see our teacher doing. Hmm. Scripture goes on to say, but among you here must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place. Pretty harsh words, isn't it? If, you would probably, if I would have you raised and you were honest about if you did any of those things, a lot of us would raise our hand, right? Further on it goes, and none of these people will be able to enter the kingdom of God. Those seems like pretty harsh words. But I hope you put them in the context of what I said before as far as that we are saved by God's grace. This call of living this way is not to somehow, is, is a, a meter for us to see whether we're in or out of God's kingdom. It's a challenge. It's a challenge to follow God's example. I want us to challenge you for, first of all, this statement here. Do not do the things that will draw you away from God. You are set aside for a purpose. There was... A school, just, I put that up because school's coming in about a week and a half. I know you don't want to be reminded of that, or maybe parents do want to be reminded of that. But a, there was a schoolyard that was built in the middle of an intersection of four busy streets, and it was built right in the middle. And when they let the school kid, the kids out for recess, when they let them out, they played really close to the building. And all they saw in the end is huge schoolyard, and they're kind of wondering, why don't they play 
out in this huge schoolyard. We want them out there because we have this facility and we want them to run off steam and to get out there and play. But all of them were playing really close by. And they were wondering what to do. So one person had an idea that maybe if we build a play set that, that about halfway out between the building and the busy uh, street, that they would go out and play on the playground. So they built the playground, and they didn't let the kids out, but the kids didn't go out to play on the playground equipment. They still played closer to the building. They're going, we built the state-of-the-art playground equipment, and why aren't they going out to play? Finally, they put out, they, someone had an idea that we should build these fen this fence on all four sides where that busy intersection, right at the perimeter of where those four busy streets are. And they constructed that. It was a pretty high fence, sturdy fence. Well, they could see through, though, but it was, it was sturdy. And right after, the day after they built it, they let the kids out to play. And the kids went out to play, and they not only played uh, next to the building, they not only played on the playground equipment, they played all the way to the fence. Hmm. And what, is this, what does that have to do with any of this? It's interesting when God sets up his rules or his commandments or his parameters, we look at those as restrictions. Those commandments that he gives to us as restrictions. Much like that list from above, all of those different things, those actions that we need to refrain from. We look at them as negative, something that hems us in, that condemns us. But I would contend God's law is given and the commandments were given to put up that parameter, those fences around those busy intersections. So that when, as life comes, if we step outside of those, those parameters, God knows that we're going to get hurt. God knows that we're going to experience the consequences of our behavior that are going to hurt us. So he sets up those commandments so that we don't live and we don't get hurt on the outside. Huh? And so when those parameters are given and when those laws are given of don't do this, of don't do that, of don't do that, it doesn't come as a harsh word. It comes as a loving word. If you go outside, you're going to get hurt. Hmm? Ephesians continues. Paul says, For you were once in darkness, but now you are children of the light. You have a different call on your life. Before in those other verses, it says, you are God's holy people, which means you are set aside for a purpose. You've received this call. God has taken you. He has saved you. He has taken you out of the kingdom of darkness and transferred you as, into the kingdom of his beloved son. There's this new call on your life. And as a new call, that you are to live as children of the light, to not go out there. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what is, pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Be careful then how you live not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. If you're going to do those things, it takes you away from God. If you are involved in those sexual immorality and coarse joking and all of those things, all, all of those certain behaviors and actions, 
it first of all distracts us from our call. And then it pulls us away. Eventually, if we continue to engage in it constantly, it takes us away from the calling, from that relationship. It puts us out in that traffic, that busy intersection. And it puts us in a way that we could get hurt. So God calls us. He said, don't do that. You have a holy calling. I have a special place for you, what to do in your life. But if you're engaged in this, you're going to get hurt. Live as wise people, making every opportunity. Hmm? When we live within God's parameters, we will be safe. We will be content. Do you know that God has, wants your best in mind? He's, he doesn't, he's not a party crusher. He wants you to have joy. He says that in scripture. I've come that you may have joy and have it to its fullest. But he also knows those things which are going to hurt you. So when he sets these parameters up and he says live is this way, he says this is where you're going to be most content and you're going to be most full of joy. And if you live within these parameters, you know that that's going to happen. And there'll be a sense of contentment in your life. Paul goes on to talk. He says, in Ephesians 5, 18 through 20, he, he talks about these sorts of things. You fill your life with good habits and godly habits. I've been working uh, for a while, um, going down as, as a chaplain down at Heartview, working with those that have addiction issues. And it's interesting in talking with them and leading them through the first four, five steps of the AA program and talking about what is important in their life and how to replace certain things in their life or what was they're using and what to replace with good things. Hmm? Because there is a reason why people use alcohol or drugs or whatever addiction we may have. And it's to fulfill something inside of us. We do it because it gives us some sort of pleasure. At least we think it does for a time. And then it becomes destructive in our life. But when, when you go through treatment and you learn to become sober, if you're going to do away with that which kind of satisfied you with whatever that drug was, you need to fill it with something else. And we talk about that. What is it that you need to fill it with? What is it that's going to give you joy in life? At first you thought this other thing would give you joy and contentment. But you realized that the alcohol or drugs was going to lead you down a path that wasn't good for you. Destructive. Now that there's a void there, what are you going to fill it with? It needs to be filled with something. What are you going to fill it with? What habits do you fill it with? And it's interesting, Paul says, do not get drunk on wine which leads to debauchery, drunkenness. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music with your heart to God, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, fill those bad habits with good habits, of number one, of worship. Of worshiping God. Of having joy. When you sing songs to God, it shouldn't be drudgery, even if you don't have a good voice. There should be a sense of of making a joyful noise to God. And singing with your hearts. Why? Because God has saved you out of this darkness. 
and giving you new life. He has, he has pulled you out of this pit and giving you a hope and a life. There's something to be sung of joy and praise to God about in our life when that happens. Huh? And we need to fill our life with good things of God. And we can't do that constantly. But what is it in your life that you can take that you know are negative behaviors and fill it with godly, good behaviors that you know are, are going to be building your spirit up and leading you to more of a godly life? Hmm? How is it that you can imitate Jesus? Hmm? There are a lot of good things to do. There's a lot of things to do in volunteering of your time to others. Nothing wrong with taking care of your body and exercising, enjoying life with entertainment. But what is it that we're filling our life with? I like these couple of these quotes from old church fathers that knew things. Augustine, he said this, and you probably have heard this before. God, you have made us for yourself. It's a prayer to God. And our hearts are restless till they find their rest in you. When we try to fill our lives and our focus on our lives are on all these other things of life. And when we we, we look at all these other things and our eyes are focused on all these other things and we're, our behavior is showing something else. We're not glorifying God. We're filling, trying to fill our heart with something else. But when our heart is focused and seeking to try to imitate Christ, we find our rest. It's like having this big hole in your heart. Right? And when Christ enters into that, then you find your contentment. Luther said, I've held many things in my hands and I've lost them all, but whatever I have placed in God's hands, still I possess. When I'm living not for myself or for what I want to do, but I'm living for God. There's fullness and contentment. And finally, from a Chinese, an affinity towards Chinese um, Christian authors, this guy's name is Watchman Nee. He said, He who is able to accept everything gladly from God, including darkness, dryness, flatness, and complete disregard for self, is he who lives for him. When there's a sense of when other things happen in life, and there's a sense where we might go through those difficulties of life, but we don't look for other things to fill ourselves up with. When our hearts are focused on him, there is contentment. We know what life is. So let's be imitators. Be imitators of God. Not distracted by all these other things. Let's be imitators of him. And when we're imitators of him, God will lead us into a life of contentment and wholeness, and others will be blessed as we do that. It's not something that we just do for ourselves. When we're living a life of contentment, our life, and we're imitating Christ, Christ was always in the mode of servanthood, wasn't he? of reaching out for the other, of loving the other. And when we're doing that, we are content in here when we're imitators of Christ. It's not a chore. It brings life to us. when We put it in the right perspective. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, I just pray that you would help us to see in our lives those areas where we have 
done and gone astray where we have attitudes or behavior or our eyes wander a certain way that is not of you. Father, help us not to be, have that overload of guilt and condemnation. Father, help us to receive your forgiveness as we confess our sins. Your word says we, we can receive your, your forgiveness, your cleansing. And help us to receive the empowerment of your spirit to be imitators of Jesus in our life. And how he treats others, how he lives for others. And how he glorifies you. And help us to know, Father, that that is what brings us contentment and wholeness in our life as we seek to glorify you. Empower us now to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Please rise to receive the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord empower you with this Holy Spirit to be imitators of Jesus, to live for him and to know the joy of living for him. In the name of the Father and the Son the Holy Spirit. Amen.